can't leave, you have to stay. Whether we like it or not, we all have been detained, held back. It's temporary, sometimes painful, sometimes it's full of joy. On this podcast today, we're going to retell some of our best stories about when we became an unintended detainee for the moment. Cue the open. This is the Life's Learning Curve Podcast. I'm Paul Hart. Stand by for unintended detainee. So it was preschool. It was the year I was going to go into kindergarten. And at the school I was to attend named Garfield, they had like a summer fair where they had some games and prizes and pull the duck out of the water. And you look at the number and you get a prize or a basketball shoot. But I'm just five years old. Kind of scared. I'm really kind of scared to go to school. I wasn't that outgoing. My sister loved to go to school. She couldn't wait to get there. She did that. She did like all these friends within a day. And for me, much more apprehensive. Can we go home now? My mom said, let's go to this uh, summer fair and we'll see what's going on. We might meet some people. We might get a feel of the school. Okay, I said, I'm not sure, but okay. I go up to my school with my mom and you have to buy tickets. So we bought tickets. We went to a couple, you know, fun attractions that little kids might like. And then out of her eye, my mom spies that there's pony rides. Pony rides. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, pony rides. Why am I emphasizing pony rides? Beautiful. My mom grew up on a farm. Pony. And for a good portion of my life, I heard all about the farm. How much she loved the farm and missed it. And I think that's true for every person that's lived on a farm and had to move into the city. They miss being out in the country. It's a whole different vibe. And I really didn't get that experience. But my mom always talked about the horses she had. Now she loved to take care of the horses, loved to go for rides in the horses. Now, I do know this was a fair and these were ponies. But my mom said, I want you to ride the ponies. Because I used to have so much fun with horses on my farm. Okay, I said. I'll do that. Well, waited in line, and the gentleman picked me up. I was, you know, five years old. Picked me up, put me on the horse, and all of a sudden you realize, man, this is a big animal. I'd never seen anything. Well, I'd never seen anything that close up that was so large. I had watched, and I wasn't too afraid of the horse because I. they slowly plotted, clop, 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 around the perimeter of the grade school, a uh, roped off area. My mom starts telling the farm stories about loving to ride horses and how she wished I had that experience. And this guy says, well, let's give him a good experience. I'll never forget this. You know, the, another set of words that's embedded in my brain. And he slaps the horse on its rear end. Slap. And the horse takes off. Now, it's not galloping, but it's trotting quickly. And for me, having no background in riding a horse, I'm bouncing all over this saddle. And my mom's saying, hold on to the saddle horn. I'm five. I don't know what a saddle horn is. What's a saddle horn? It's the thing in front of you. So I grab the saddle horns and there's no reins because they're ponies in the thing and I'm bouncing all over the saddle and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really bugged by this. I I would rather just have gone slowly and then kind of got used to it slowly. Didn't happen that way. And suddenly I look down to my right arm and I see something. Something's wrong. A day earlier, I had gone in for my physical for kindergarten. Okay, very good. My physical contained a lot of different things, but one of the things that I remember, and probably the only thing I remember about that physical, was the fact that I got a shot called a polio shot. Polio shot. Anybody from my generation that got polio shots, you've got a little a little scar on your arm or your hip area from a polio shot and they used to inject this polio uh, vaccine into you and it would make a bubble on your arm and very slowly within like a day it would seep into your body or two days or something so we all had these polio bubble things and 
the doctor had said, Okay, so don't break this bubble on your arm, whatever you do. Just don't, because that's got, you know, this life-saving um, a vaccine. Okay, all right. So I was very careful with my arm. I looked at it a lot, and I touched it just a little bit. I was wearing a short sleeve shirt. And apparently when the gentleman picked me up as a five-year-old to put me on the horse, where he grabbed me below my shoulder was exactly where the vaccine was. To cut back to the pony ride, there I was flopping all over the saddle, scared to death of this horse, and I looked on my arm and I see blood and I see also fluid running down my arm and a big stain in the side of my shirt where the vaccine had been injected. I was like, oh no, because when you're five years old, you don't know. Am I going to die before I you know, get back to where the pony started? Will I? And so I'm like, oh, 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 I didn't know. You know, I didn't know exactly if this kept me alive or what it actually did, but I needed that vaccine and I couldn't mess this up. <laughs> so <laughs> we finally get back to the beginning of where I'm going to get off. And the guy takes a couple steps, and he slaps the horse on the rear end again. Whack! And off the horse goes this time. We're galloping. It didn't gallop the whole way. And I'm trying to yell to my mom. She's yelling to me, I paid for you to go around one more time. And I'm yelling, My polio vaccine blew up! <laughs> Okay, so when I made it all the way around, got off the horse, and I was like, <laughs> pulled my shirt up, showed my arm to my mom, and she's like, oh, how did that happen? And I was like, you <laughs> picked me up to put me on the, on the horse, and, 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 and it broke. So I actually had to ask her if I was going to die. And she said, you're not going to die, but let's call the doctor and find out. The doctor said, it's probably okay. You probably got enough of a vaccine. It was all going to be fine. But that was the time I got detained by a pony ride and an exploded polio vaccine. In a previous podcast, I talked about um, helping my dad. He was a principal in August the late summer months, he would he would take a few weeks off of school, take a little vacation, and he would come back and work setting up school for the next school year. And oftentimes he asked my sister and I to go out and asked if we wanted to help, and we did. One of the things that I did routinely was, and I liked doing it, was to get the ladder out of the storage area and go up on the roof and get down all the kickballs that had been lost up there from the previous year or softballs or anything else that was up there that was odd. And I liked doing it, you know, and it was also something I think he knew that I liked and it kept me busy while I was there. So I got the ladder out. I remember it was an old wooden ladder and it was really light. It was it was easy to maneuver and like that. And I, I think I was probably around sixth grade and I remember climbing up on the roof, which I had done maybe seven or eight times doing the same thing to get balls down. Remember those red kick balls and the sound it made when you kicked them? It's like... <laughs> anyway, I remember going up on the roof and looking, and it was very panoramic. And it was one of the first times in my life I remember looking and just going, wow, it's beautiful from up here. You can see not just the school, but you can see the end of the playground. You can see the train tracks. You can see the trains come by. You can see downtown from here and City Hall. It was, it was gorgeous. It was like a long shot, <laughs> a cinematic long shot. Then I would find the kickballs and walk the, around the roof and I'd find all the extra things that were up there. And then I would uh, toss them down in one area. I was just finishing up and kind of standing there looking out. All of a sudden I hear this voice from down on the ground and it's going, ooky, ooky, ooky. And I was like, uh, what was that? Uh, it probably wasn't for me. And then again I hear, ooky, ooky, ooky. 
So I go to the edge and I look down and it's the custodian. It's Mr. Moore. I know him and he knows me. I, you know, we I've been around with my dad for years. And he goes, Ookie, okay, Ookie, okay, I caught you now. I caught you now. You're up on the roof. And I said, uh, Mr. Moore, it's me. And he goes, looks a little bit, and then he, I, I point at my face. <laughs> I don't know what else to do. I point at my face. Here's my face. It's me. I said, it's Paul. I'm Mr. Hart's son. I don't care. And he son you are. looks down, and he's like, oh, oh, oh. He wasn't the type of guy that would say he's sorry. So he just kind of moved on. I figured at Mr. Moore's house, if somebody was doing something that wasn't right, that they probably said, okay. I realized he was saying, okay, okay, okay. I mean, that thus was his words, but for him, it came out as ooky. Ooky, ooky, ooky. For all my teenage years, I loved to, <laughs> if I had to agree with somebody, I used to say, ooky. People would just look at me and go, what? Detained by Mr. Moore, the custodian. A year prior to that, I was in fifth grade, I remember, and at recess time, our teacher was teaching us, well, you learn a lot about rules and society and what you can and can't do in elementary school, as well as a lot of other places, but our teacher was uh, teaching us softball when we went out to recess. We stood in line when we were up to bat, and then the people in the field, you know, she explained the positions. It was pretty cool for a teacher to go through that whole process. And when lunch recess came, we would eat lunch for 15 minutes and go outside for 15 minutes. We played softball because our teacher was teaching it. We liked it. We had a lot of fun with the softball. Our team was up to bat first, and my friend Mike was batting, and I was second to bat. A girl named Peggy was pitching, and she pitched the first pitch. Mike took a huge cut. He's right-handed. He took a huge cut, swung, and then released the, didn't let go of the bat, but he just took a big cut with the bat and let his left arm swing out behind him. It hit me square in the temple of my head. Now imagine that, getting hit in the head full force with a baseball bat. That's really what happened. He took a cut and hit me in the head with the bat. Now I was far enough away where if he had not extended his arm, it wouldn't have hit me. Still, I was too close. Well, I remember falling to the ground. That was the first thing. And as I fell to the ground, it felt like slow motion. In my head, I saw everyone laugh. I saw the pitcher laugh. I saw all the players on the field laugh. And then I was really dizzy. Next thing I knew, I was in the office and they were putting ice on my head. My dad was principal at that school, but he was at a meeting, and he wasn't there. And I remember the secretary was just using lots and lots of ice. And apparently, I, I reached up with my left hand and I felt the temple of my head, and it had a pretty big tennis ball-sized bump, and it was throbbing, and I felt with my fingers, and it felt mushy. I do remember the other kids in fifth grade were kind of mad at me because they said I used up all their ice for their experiment in science that afternoon. I went to the doctor who sent me to the hospital. They took uh, x-rays of my head and there was no uh, concussion as they could see. Keep, keep some ice on that. But they did say there was no fracture in the skull. Stay still. Uh, there was nothing to be worried about. And of course that led me to come back to school many weeks later and say they x-rayed my head at the hospital and found nothing. <laughs> You know, that's an extremely hysterical joke when you're 10 and 11. <laughs> I was detained by my friend Mike after he hit me in the head with a baseball bat. My dad had grown up... He was a depression kid. He was... Uh, probably about seven, eight years old when the Great Depression hit in 1929. As he told me later on, he said, well, the Depression really didn't matter too much because we didn't have too much money to start out with. There you go. 
so my dad and his best friend, Ralph, were hey, Ralph. pals. Hey, Hugo. Apparently in the town that they lived in, which was a small farming town, the boys who were all that age were all kind of getting into trouble. The here. town council decides, this would be in the 19, early 1930s, mid-1930s, the town council decides that every boy in town within the ages of 9 and 15 has to go to social etiquette school on Saturdays. What? Huh? <laughs> it sounds like the music man, the, the play the music man. You know, uh, this will straighten the kids out, an etiquette class. As the story was told to me, my dad and Ralph went to pick each other up. They kind of saw themselves as this group of kids that did movies back in that day called the, the Dead End Kids or the East End Kids. Yeah, sure, sure. Hunts Hall, Leo Gorsi. Uh, they were kind of tough and rugged and... Hey, what about this, man? What about this? Hey, you're not going to push me around. What's the big idea? Those kind of kids. What do you say? What do you know? So they were emulating which they saw in the movie theaters every Saturday. So as they're going to become a proper social citizen class with most of the other young boys in town, they got to the class door and they signed in and then they took off running. And then according to my dad's friend Ralph, as the other boys in town went through etiquette class and were sitting there learning how to walk and address people properly, they threw rocks at the window. So, I, I believe this is something my father was not too proud of and didn't want to retell me, but his friend Ralph did. So, how does this apply? Well, when I got into 7th and 8th grade, there were those kids in junior high school, now called middle school, that was just obnoxious. You know, the weren't necessarily mean, they were just obnoxious, the type of people that would slap you and walk away or hit you or walk away or they'd say, stupid, and walk away, stupid, walk away. And it's not that the word stupid even bothered you, because it didn't bother me, but they would do this to everybody. My dad was always worried that somebody was gonna take a punch or take a swing at me, but the facts actually were nobody ever did really take a swing at me because by that age, I was playing football, I was larger, I, I was taller. I was tall for my age. I was about six feet tall at that time. Didn't grow since then. Nobody was really taking swings at me or doing anything like that. And my dad would say, does anybody ever bother you at school? Because don't let people push you around. Now, he was a principal. And so he wasn't encouraging fighting. But what he was encouraging was standing up for yourself. If you ever do get pushed into a corner, if you do back down, he always felt that you're kind of branded a coward. You're kind of branded a weaker person. But I really never had to deal with that. Until. 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 There was a boy named Marty, and he was in a class with me. And Marty kind of picked on and pushed everybody else. And he was small, and he was fast, and he was wiry. Generally, with Marty, you couldn't catch him. And he got into this thing where he began to just randomly walk up to people and whack, he'd slap them. And they'd be dumbfounded, you know, because you don't really expect anybody to walk up and slap you, ever. So, so Marty was doing this on a regular basis. And I thought to myself, well, I hope he doesn't do that to me. He did. For about three or four days, he would run up behind me and whack, slap me on the side of the face. And it was hard. And I didn't like it. I was very unused to that happening. I thought, next time I'm in that class, I have to be aware of Marty. Where is he? I have to know that he's there. And sure enough, a few days later, I think, Marty came up and smacked me. Whack! And it hurt, and I was ready. I'm not endorsing any kind of violence here, but I took him and I grabbed him and I just pushed him against the wall. Hard. Bam, he went against the wall. And Marty actually said the exact thing my dad said <laughs> anyone would say who was picking on another student or another person. He got up off the ground and he said, Man, I'm not going to do that to you again. And he walked away. I was detained by Marty with a slap.
when I was a sophomore in high school, um, I came into school one day. A lot of people were telling me, Gus is looking for you. Hey, man, Gus is looking Gus. for you. And I thought, well, I don't know anybody named Gus. Who's Gus? I said, well, Gus is looking for you. You better watch out because he's mad. Gus. <laughs> well, I didn't know anybody named Gus. My neighbors had a dog named Gus, but I didn't know any Gus. As time passed throughout the day, enough people were telling me about this until I realized, well, there's something to this. I don't know what it is or what's what's going on. When you're in high school, uh, sometimes people come to the door, knock on the door, and it's a page from the office, and they have to give you a message about something, this or that. So um, there's a knock on the door. Somebody asked for me, so I went out in the hallway, and it was this guy. And apparently this was Gus, but I didn't know what was Gus. I'd never seen him before in my life, and he was about a foot shorter than I was. He had long, really curly hair. This was the 70s, late 70s. He says, Are you calling my girlfriend? And I said, Well, who's your girlfriend? Because you know, I didn't know. Sometimes you don't know who's attached to what. And he said, You're calling my girlfriend. And I said, tell me who she is. And with that, he took a swing at me. And I remember the fist coming up because I was taller. He hit me right in the mouth. I had my hands in my pockets. Not a good idea, incidentally, to have your hands in, in your pockets when somebody's kind of threatening you. And when he hit me, I had, uh, like, change in my pockets. Like, dimes, nickels, and quarters went all over the place on the floor. So I'm trying to figure out what to do. I remember my father saying, because being a principal, uh, don't ever hit back. You can pin the person up against the wall, but don't hit back. If you hit back, you're going to be suspended. And uh, you know, that's not a good thing. It's an, an aggressive act. Good shot, hit me right in the mouth. Now this was the 70s and I had my cool 70s clothes on. So I had purple pants on, yeah I know. And I had this white and purple shirt on, yeah I know. Uh, a belt, tucked in shirt, it was so cool. And anyway, hit me in the mouth. It didn't hurt, but I remember immediately ran my tongue over my lips. And I felt my lip was hanging down to my chin. So apparently my teeth had severed my upper lip and it had come down to the chin. And there was blood. And as I spoke, the blood was spitting. I didn't feel any loose teeth. Thank goodness. And I had just gotten my braces off. My mind flashed for a second. If you did any damage to my teeth after my parents scraped and saved for braces, and I just got them off, and you ruined my teeth? Oh, I was mad. Because he didn't just hit me. It was like he hit my entire family. Right in the budget account at the old savings and loan. So I grabbed this guy, and I... I, it, w it wouldn't have been fair. I, I was probably like uh, 192 pounds back then, and this guy was probably 140 pounds. And I spun him, and I just put him up against the wall. And uh, next person that came by me, I said, S somebody get a teacher, get a teacher. It's probably a blessing for me because I got blood all over my purple clothes, which, you know, uh, I shouldn't have been wearing anyway. You know, We get taken to the office. And one of my dad's good friends, Mr. Will Brandt, and he saw me, and he goes, oh, my gosh. Well, he got me into the nurse. The nurse, of course, gives me ice. Ice is always the first thing that happens in any kind of accident. I have ice in my mouth. And he asked me what happened. I tell him. And, Gus hit me. Uh, he asked Gus, you know, what happened, and he told him whatever. Uh, as it turns out, he told me who his girlfriend was, and, and I, I didn't know her. We didn't have classes together. But uh, as it turns out, he had told his girlfriend that he didn't want her flirting with other people. And uh, she wasn't, hadn't been flirting with me, but she was mad at him. And so she wanted to make him uh, uh, um, just freak him out. So one day, apparently, as I was walking out of school, she said, well, that guy keeps calling me. And that guy, you know, keeps staring at me in class. And I didn't even know who she was. I'll never forget when Mr. Wilbrandt called my dad on the phone. 
and said the following. Hey, Bob, this is Jim. Looks like your son got involved in a little love at school today. And I thought to myself, what? A little love? I, 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 like I had anything to do with this. I just got called out of class and got punched in the mouth because some girl lied about something else. Anyway, according to my sister, my dad was so excited that I had been involved in defending myself oh, yeah, sure. and and uh, uh, not choosing not to be pushed around by someone. And I didn't punch the guy, didn't do anything to hurt him, but I pinned him up against the wall and bled on him. He loved that. It was like I had just joined the Dead End Kids Club yeah, sure, sure. that my dad and his friend Ralph looked up to so much in the 1930s. Nobody's gonna push me around, see? Yeah, why I oughta... <laughs> you got ugly Went to my doctor, got a couple uh, stitches. It was a crazy time and I did go back to school the very next day and there's no better accreditation than coming to school all stitched up after a fight and all your friends are like, yeah, yeah, what happened to you? You know, and that's where you pull out the old, you should see the other guy. You know, and unfortunately the other guy, because he hit me, he got a weak suspension. I got momentarily detained by Gus, who hit me in the mouth. When I look back at my youth, I laugh at most of it these days. I believed in everything when I was young. I believed in magic, and I believed the truth happened all the time, and being detained, each time would be a learning curve. Each time it happened, I'd learn from it. From the innocence of an exploded polio shot to a baseball bat to the head, it is not who detains us, but rather how and why it happened in the first place. I'm gonna rub another hole in your head. <laughs> For Life's Learning Curve, I'm Paul Hart. Our show is put together by producer Paul Hart, along with Robert Randall, Bruce Klein, and S.T. Dog. Mixed by Chad Loebner. Technical director Dave Varney. Musical assistance by the Walrus Filters, Riley Hart. And this show, special thanks to Bob Moore, Gus Hetley, and Ed Abbott. Our website, lifeslearningcurve.buzzsprout.com. Some names and voices were changed for entertainment purposes. Help us grow and continue by liking us on Facebook and listening to us practically everywhere all podcasts are found. I'm Paul Hart. We will be back soon with more stories from Life's Learning Curve. We're clear.